Shivram, thank you for the wonderful video. Uh, uh, needless to say, it's a good thing to uh, know about IIT Madras a lot. So, uh, good evening and a very warm welcome to everyone. We appreciate you being here with us today. It's nice to see you uh, all here again. And as I've been telling in the previous webinar that uh, the IRIS webinar series is gaining a momentum in the public domain. It's my pleasure to happily share that we have crossed uh, thousands and thousands of registrations and participants. So the main idea behind these webinar series is to showcase the innovative research uh, that is being generated at IIT Madras to various stakeholders like researchers, industrialists, and policymakers. And yes, and yes, we are here again. It's our pleasure to present the 10th webinar, uh, which is virtual reality and haptics in the CIRIS webinar series under the cluster sensing and vision. So this uh, research initiative, especially under the, uh, the virtual reality and haptics uh, technology project is led by Professor Dr. M. Manivannan. So to say a few words about Dr. Manivannan. So Dr. Manivannan is a professor of uh, biomedical engineering at IIT Madras uh, in the Department of uh, Applied Mechanics. So he received postdoctoral training at, at the MIT in Cambridge. So he was visiting a uh, visiting scientist at the MGH, Mr. Uh, General Hospital of Harvard Medical School in Boston and a visiting faculty in the Christian Medical College CMC Willow. So before MIT and Harvard, he received another postdoctoral training at the National Institute of Standards of Technology, NIST, Maryland. So before joining IIT Madras in June, uh, June 2005, he was serving as the uh, chief software architect of Yantrik in uh, a spin-off company of MIT Touch Lab in Cambridge, MA. So in 2005, he has set up the, uh, the first uh, touch lab in India at IIT Madras, which is known as the uh, Haptics Lab. Uh, he holds PhD and ME degrees from the Indian Institute of Science, IASC Bangalore. So joining Professor Manivanan as a speaker of today's webinar, we also have Dr. Stephen. Uh, has joined as the moderator. So, well, Dr. Stephen is an American computer scientist and a professor in the Faculty of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering at the University of Fulham. So, he was also an early founder and head scientist of Oculus VR until it was acquired by Facebook in 2014. Uh, he was a postdoctoral researcher and a lecturer in the Computer Science Department at Stanford University. Uh, from 1997 to 2001, he was an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at Lowa State University. So from 2001 to 2018, he was on the faculty in the uh, Department of Computer Science at the University of Illinois at the Urbana campaign as a full professor. So since 2018, he has been a professor at the University of Holland, Finland. So uh, it's my pleasure to invite all the panelists to the uh, session. Before handing over the uh, session to Dr. Steve, uh, note to participants, uh, please use the uh, Q&A box uh, at the bottom to enter your questions and upload the questions that interest you so the moderator can prioritize them later on. Over to you, Dr. Steve. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction and, and for the invitation to speak here. I, I really appreciate the, the, the great honor. Um, and in uh, kicking off this, this new center that IIT Madras has, it's very exciting. Um, I have only a couple of slides here, but let me just uh, share a bit, um, if you don't mind. Um, so um, what I want to talk about is a subject I call uh, perception engineering, which is some description or way to describe uh, virtual and augmented and mixed reality, these kinds of strongly immersive technologies that we see developing. Um, before getting into that, I just want to explain a little bit about my connection to IIT Madras. I've had a very wonderful and fond kind of connection to it going back to 2008 when I visited the campus the first time. Um, my visit was hosted by Professor Srinivasa Murthy, who was then the dean, and I think he became director later at some point. Um, he's actually the father of a friend of mine, uh, Sid uh, Hartha Srinivasan, who's a professor at the University of Washington now. So, so I sort of had a little inside connection back then. And Professor Ravi Balaraman of the Computer Science Department was also hosting me then. I came back in 2015 um, and, and met Professor Mani Van on then, and I had a wonderful time spending the summer on the campus teaching a virtual reality course to the students there. And I was particularly excited that it was part of NPTEL. I really like the Indian approach, the Indian national approach to uh, online free education. I was not as excited by more proprietary kinds of formats and um, um, sort of online coursework that's more pay per use. And uh, I really like the NPTEL system. And so I'm very happy to see that 
my courses materials there are still used quite a bit. Um, I continue to do collaborations with IIT Madras and became an affiliate professor in 2020. And our collaborations continue today on things such as tactile sensing, haptic interaction, human perception, and, and such things in the context of virtual reality, mainly with Professor Mani Van Nan. Um, so what is perception engineering? I consider that to be an emerging discipline that involves designing, creating, and maintaining perceptual illusions. These could be visual, auditory, or haptic in the case of this particular center that, that, that we're talking about today, um, which is probably the most, most challenging and interesting one of all. Um, so, so in my own work, I'm, I'm trying to develop a kind of, let's say, unified brain theory that covers both robotics, which is a field I've worked in for, for decades, and virtual reality. And um, in that, I've been applying um, ideas and concepts from game theory with this notion of information spaces. I, I view a lot of these problems of um, perception as a kind of um, game where the, the, the state of the game can't be measured, but it's interactive. And you cannot measure it directly, but you interact through sensing and actuation, whether it's a robotic system or a human system or other organisms, this is the kind of situation that's dealt with. So we want to know what does it mean to design a perceptual illusion across the whole span from engineered systems, like say a purely robotic or autonomous system, all the way over to organisms, including of course humans. In order to do that, this involves growing a new discipline that uses engineering and mathematical principles, but also needs to borrow heavily from the sciences of psychology and neuroscience. Um, so this is a kind of view that I imagine looking across um, the disciplines. You have the engineering side in green, where just making the visual component requires um, optical engineering, um, often computer vision, sensor fusion, all sorts of electronics and computer graphics, mem sensing, human computer interaction comes up. And, and I've actually neglected um, the mechanical engineering side, which, 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 which leads right into haptics and Professor Mani Vano will be talking about this. So the, the center uh, fills a kind of hole that, that's not even in my vision here because I, I sort of chose to talk about the easier ones, which is um, just, you know, just the vision part, which is the one that's much more developed in the virtual reality industry. And then complementary to this is what I call reverse engineering in kind of a playful way, which um, are the, the sciences that deal with um, biological organisms that we did not design as humans, but we're forced to analyze them and try to understand how they work by poking and prodding at them and dissecting them in some kind of way. And so the, the human physiology is, is analogous to mechanical engineering or, or computer engineering, but, um, but, but, but it involves sort of probing and understanding how these mechanisms work, um, whether it's the human vision system or uh, physiology of, um, of uh, say muscles and, and control of muscles and, and these sort of things. Um, neuroscience then fits closely into that, and then human vision science and cognitive science and perceptual psychology. So we have to somehow handle these reverse engineering subjects, and, and they fit together with engineering to develop this new field of perception engineering. Um, so, so just as, um, say, um, a long time ago, uh, physics principles became adapted and applied in some way to develop the foundations of engineering, starting with civil engineering and then growing into mechanical engineering and electrical um, we, we too have to now take these, these sciences um, that are listed in the red box here and develop them, in, incorporate them using this engineering methodology or mentality into developing this field of perception engineering, which involves, um, I'll say it again, um, um, designing, creating, and maintaining perceptual illusions. So after having said that, I, I will now um, return the control over to Professor Mani Bannan, who will talk about uh, the center now. Thank you, Professor Steve, for the wonderful you know, uh, introduction of the, the challenges in virtual reality. As a leader in uh, virtual reality, you have uh, now succinctly put uh, all the important points. In the next few minutes, I would uh, uh, go over the, the main objective of the center. I will introduce the members of the centers, and uh, I will list a couple of uh, now projects in our center. And uh, no, we also have a plan of the in inaugurating the you know, uh, center uh, formally by uh, Dr. Chindan Vaishnav. 
and uh, we have this consortium inauguration by our Dr. Neeraj Mittal. And uh, after this inauguration, and Dr. Srinivas, Srinivasan, Mandem Srinivasan, and uh, Dr. Sadhanand, Venkat Sadhanand, will be you know, briefly describing their interest in the center. And then I will hand over back to the you know, session to you. You can uh, moderate it with uh, all the questions. So uh, let me start my presentation. A yeah, very short presentation of our center. So, um, just like what you have mentioned, this Steve, uh, uh, the vision of your uh, uh, for your uh, research in virtual reality, we we also have a motivation to see how our perception engineering or illusion engineering can help us in designing better virtual reality systems. That is one of the main motivations. And then in India, we have a uh, no, uh, large youth population and we have the very high onus on no, uh, upskilling them. So we have a plan of you know, using the virtual reality technologies to no, uh, skill training them, upskilling the skill training, the entire no, uh, youth of India. So how virtual reality can be useful in enhancing the human operator performance, operator performance, specifically skill training. We have a separate ministry called uh, skills ministry. And that is because now we need a lot of skilling requirements. And the third is how haptics can play a major important role in the no, the important topics of the virtual reality, like embodiment, the body ownership, uncanny valley, or the simulation sickness or vexion, how haptics can no, uh, help us to address those challenges in the virtual reality uh, and the social presence. So for example, we see this uh, Zoom meeting, but there is no haptic feedback in the Zoom meetings, whatever we are listening to it. What do, there is a you now haptics in the Zoom meetings. So uh, can we do a study? Will it increase the you now presence? These are the you know, researches we want to look at. And finally, we have a you know, grand vision of you now making a virtual reality corridor in India or making the India as a virtual reality corridor for the entire world, just like the entire world knows India as now as an IT corridor. We will describe these projects uh, uh, briefly in the coming slides. Uh, Professor Mani, uh, sorry to interrupt, but to one of the questions from the audience that's important, I think, is uh, could you just give a simple explanation of what haptic means? Because I, th I think that people outside of the field might not quite know yes. what we're talking about. Yeah, so haptics is a science of touch, just like a vision, and is a science of seeing, and uh, auditory is a science of hearing. So haptics is a science of touching and feeling. So uh, with that simple introduction, let me pass on to the, the other um, uh, uh, introducing this OPAs. We have a, a six faculty as a part of the center. Srinivas Chakravarti, he's a professor in uh, biotechnology and uh, he's a neuroscience uh, uh, expert. His main interest in virtual reality is to enable or design rehabilitation system specifically for the neuroscience-based rehabilitation systems. There are a lot of diseases as uh, patients with the neuro, uh, uh, neuro rehabilitation is what we are looking at here. And uh, Professor Kaushik Mitra from Electrical Engineering, his expertise is a computational imaging. He would like to use all the image processing and the signal processing technologies to improve the virtual reality systems. And we have uh, Professor Amit, uh, from uh, Department of Management Sciences. His focus is uh, decision engineering. He would like to uh, uh, see how virtual reality can be used to improve the decision engineering in a, no, in a corporate environment, or even now how decision engineering can be useful in virtual reality for designing the uh, better UI system or in very, uh, various applications. So digital manufacturing or industry 4.0. We have Dr. Mansi Sarma, 
who is expertise in uh, 3D display technologies, specifically light field technologies. Uh, he will be designing new displays for virtual reality in India. Specifically, now we are we have now problems in getting the hardware. We are hardware from China, so uh, India needs to address the hardware's depth uh, in India, and uh, probably our center is trying to focus as uh, in the you no know, manufacturing our own hardware, and you now designing our own hardware, and uh, you now deploying our own hardware. And uh, Dr. Lada Diaram from uh, Department of Management Sciences. She has uh, expertise in uh, uh, organizational psychology, corporate psychology, and she is planning to use virtual reality in uh, uh, improving the organizational psychology in a corporate setup. And uh, I have uh, uh, finally uh, uh, myself, I have a uh, uh, specialization in haptics and computational physiology and medical simulation. We have interest in uh, using the virtual reality for skill training the doctors, specifically medical skills training. We have several, uh, our colleagues from other IITs as well, from IIT Jodhpur, IIT Bombay, IIT Gauhati, Indians of Science, and uh, IIT Mandi. We have uh, clinical collaborators from uh, uh, AIMS New Delhi, AIMS Mangalgiri, Chitmar, Madras Medical College, PJ Chandigarh, Bangalore, there's Rajiv Gandhi uh, Medical College, and uh, we have Dr. Sadanand from Loma Linda. He has uh, uh, joined with us today. He'll be the speaker uh, at the end of this uh, presentation. And we have several global leaders as part of this uh, center. We have uh, Gerald Loeb from University of Southern California, and uh, he has the expertise in designing uh, finest uh, tactile sensors, neuroprosthetic. He's a leader in biomedical engineering. We have uh, Ed Colgate. He's a leader in haptics uh, from Northern, uh, Northwestern University. We have uh, uh, Dr. Monte M. Srinivasan. He's the uh, father of haptics, modern haptics. And uh, I'm glad that you know, he has joined with us today and uh, he'll be you know, talking at the end of this presentation. And Dr. Mel Slater, he's a leader of virtual reality sense of embodiment from uh, University of Barcelona, Spain. And uh, no, Steve is uh, uh, with us today. And Dr. Chatai Bostegan from Turkey. He's again a world leader in uh, haptic and specifically uh, uh, biomechanics. And we have uh, Jung Kim from South Korea. He's a leader in robotics and haptics together. And uh, finally, uh, Dr. Marimuthu Palani Swami. He is a global leader in IoT and cyber physical systems. He is from University of Melbourne, Australia. Apart from this, we have several other global leaders, as from each of our uh, uh, our members of uh, uh, our team. And we have uh, uh, four advisors, specifically looking at uh, how to run this uh, uh, center. We have uh, Dr. Prakash Damodaran, is an IAS officer. He's the first IT secretary of Tamil Nadu. Uh, he's uh, uh, joined with us today. And Dr. Neeraj Mitchell, he's a current IT secretary of uh, Tamil Nadu government. And Dr. Hansraj Verma, he's again an IAS officer. Uh, he's running this uh, rural development and Panjait Raj of uh, Tamil Nadu government. Again, uh, now since one of the objective of our center is to take the, the latest technology to the bottom of the pyramid or the rural side of it, it's, uh, Dr. Hansraj Verma uh, will be uh, advising us on uh, how to take the technology to the to have the maximum social impact. And then finally, Dr. Alok Nath Bey, he is the vice president and CTO of Samsung. He will be advising us on how to interface with industries. And uh, I will now request our, uh, our uh, co-PIs, Dr. Kaushik Mitra to talk about uh, his research. Over to you, Dr. Kaushik Mitra. Hello. So um, I work in computational imaging 
And uh, so computational imaging, uh, if someone, someone is not familiar with it, so it is basically uh, what we are doing is it's a co-design of imaging optics and processing algorithms. And the goal is that using this co-design of the optics and algorithm, we could have better performance than the conventional camera. So that's more or less about computational imaging. So I work mostly on the uh, algorithm side of it. And we are interested in developing processing algorithms for novel cameras. So here we'll look at some of the novel cameras and how they can be useful for AR, VR application. Okay. So one of these uh, cameras, which is very recent, is this lensless cameras. So this lensless, as the name suggests, uh, these are cameras without the lens. And why we want them? Because uh, it is the lens which increases the form factor. Because uh, once you put a lens, then the distance between the lens and sensor should be more than at least the focal length. So that way it increases the size of the camera. And uh, so that increases the form factor. Then the other thing is that uh, it also makes it, uh, the lenses are generally bulky, so it makes it more um, uh, weight, it increases the weight of the camera. So, and also it increases, so most of the, ex and the, most of the expenses in a camera goes in the lenses. So you want to make it uh, aberration free and all those things. So what this lensless camera is doing is we replace, we basically, we throw away the lens and then we put a mask in front of the sensor. And now the advantage is that it is very thin form factor. In fact, this, uh, the distance between the mask and the sensor is like one mm. So it makes it very, very thin form factor and it's also very lightweight. And uh, so these things, this thin form factor and lightweight is what we need for AR, VR devices. So it's very, so it's, so this lensless camera is uh, very much applicable for AR, VR devices. So that's what we are exploring. And uh, what we are looking at is we can reconstruct like once we have this lensless camera. So one of the things is we can also reconstruct what the scene is. But I think uh, more important than that is to estimate the ego motion of the AR VR devices. And that's what we are trying. So we are computing optical flow. And from there, we are trying to estimate the trajectory. So this is an ongoing project. So basically, one of the focus is to use this lensless uh, cameras for doing AR VR application. So this is one of the things. Then the other thing is like, uh, we, there is also another kind of sensors which are known as neuromorphic sensors or event sensors. So unlike traditional cameras, uh, if you want to capture videos, it is like it will capture all the pixels at a certain frame rate, let's say 30 frames per second. But it's a waste of resource, not all the pixels are changing at all the time. So what this event sensor or neuromorphic sensors does it only captures those pixels or those, so it basically captures the change in intensity for those pixels which experience them. And if it is, all it does is if the change in intensity is positive, like if the light has increased, then it will output plus one. And if the light has decreased, it will output minus one. And obviously it will also say which sensor is experiencing a plus one and which is experiencing minus one. Now, the advantage of these kind of sensors are they are very, very fast. So they can actually have, it can capture some million uh, events per second. So it makes them very, very low latency or very fast. And the other advantage is they have very low power, mostly because the ADC now does not need to do, I mean, generally we have eight bit ADC, but now we are just outputting plus one, minus one. So it's almost like a one bit. So that makes it also low power. And these are the things we need for ARVR. So definitely we need low power devices. And we also would like to have low latency so that even fast motion can be captured well. And this, so what we are looking at is uh, these kind of cameras and how we can integrate them. I mean, this work has been going on, like not just in our lab, but many other labs throughout the world. And uh, this is uh, like a lot of research is going on this. So this is also one of the uh, one of the area that we are looking at. So recently we looked at how we can estimate optical flow using deep learning techniques. So the other, the third focus area that we are interested in is low light imaging. So for example, if we capture a low light image, generally the color as well as there's a lot of noise. So color information is lost and we see a lot of noise. Now, what we are looking at, how can we restore this image as if it looks like uh, captured with a good light? And we are looking at deep learning methods for doing it. And this will, be have, this will have applications, uh, especially for military or army. 
where and especially where they are going for a nighttime surveillance and all. So in that case, what we can do is if they're wearing an AR device, so there are night vision cameras uh, or night uh, Google night goggles also. But what we can do is uh, if they are wearing something like an AR, um, so for example, a micro micro soft color lens kind of thing, then what we can do is we can capture these images which are very dark, and then we can use our algorithm to restore it, and then we can superimpose it on the real scene. So that's one of the things that we want to explore. And the final thing is uh, content generation, which is very important for AR VR. So, and one way of generating 3D content is to use light field cameras. But this light field camera basically means that you're capturing multiple views of the scene at the same time. And uh, the way it has been captured, so initially it was like an array of camera was used for capturing the light field. Obviously it is very bulky, it's not portable. But uh, like more recently, uh, there is this lensless array you can put in front of the sensor. And this uh, was, a, there was a product called Lightro on that. Uh, but still to come to the smartphone and using such kind of techniques are not so easy. And so what we want to do is capture light field using the already the camera that exists in smartphones. For example, the, many of the smartphone has dual lens or stereo cameras. So we can use this stereo camera and then we can uh, get the light field, like reconstruct the light field, or we can use the dual pixel sensors. So this, uh, these also, they are used for autofocus. So we can use them for acquiring light field as well as we are thinking that even from a single camera, if we can get a good depth map, we can get light field. And once we have this light field, we can do this kind of uh, novel view synthesis and defocus, changing the focus and depth also we get. So this will be, I mean, this, this technique is, uh, so our goal is that using a smartphone, people will be able to capture light field and that way we can generate 3D content. So these are the four areas that uh, we are looking at. And uh, all, uh, I mean, these, yeah. uh, the first two of them are more about sensors, novel sensors and how we can use them for AR VR. The other two are more about, um, like the third one is more about doing just processing and uh, enhancing the images. And the fourth one is uh, about uh, content generation, 3D content generation. So thank you, Professor Kaushik. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, uh, the, the, oops, yeah. The, uh, the images are now animating, supposed to be animating earlier. Okay. Now, uh, uh, I requested Dr. Manchi Sharma to, go through her research field very briefly. Dr. Manchi Sharma, over to you, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah, I'm Balkis Slaidia. Yeah, I've been working in the area of 3D comparison and uh, uh, computational imaging, and uh, particularly targeting 3D display applications for auto stereoscopic and light field displays. So my role at this uh, uh, Center for Excellence is basically to advance the knowledge among the 3D scene sensing, the light field analysis, interpretation, and its full palette uh, visualization in a 3D display. So basically, uh, we have divided uh, uh, the individual projects, which uh, we have firstly to uh, target about 3D scene sensing and content creation. So we integrated uh, into like focusing on the problems of uh, optimal spatial angular uh, resolutions for the light field. So the new challenges are coming, like how to adapt to the light fields uh, displays and full palette visualizations, and how to cope with the wide uh, baselines of close and light field challenges, like conditional lightning conditions. And also uh, we are focusing on the, uh, like how we can generate uh, auto stereoscopic 3D contents for uh, con uh, focusing on the challenges on uh, homogeneous and the refractive surfaces. So basically we want to focus on both kinds of like nanomaterial and non material and uh, the next focus is basically more about computational imaging and compression policy, handling the problems of analyzing interpretation and compression of the light field data because light field data is quite, uh, it's quite computationally expensive. So bringing this in on a compatible, uh, affordable light field uh, with, uh, full palette displays is a big challenging thing. So uh, in order to have like a, a kind of a representation of the scene, because representation of the scene is totally much critical because it will affect the complete processing chain of the 3D displays from capture till display stage. So how to represent this scene? So enhanced light for representation, we need to focus upon that, incorporating geometrical information in the light. 
And particularly, we will wish to target combination of image based and the geometric based methods so in the representation. So, have an enhanced light -free representation that will be useful for full palette visualization. Another is like, is like uh, in the vision and the visualization of this content, we need to address uh, uh, the related problems also uh, of the parallax visualization. Also, we need to see the related problems of quantifying that uh, or sexual aspects of continuous parallax. So this is one of the lake variation because once we solve this problem and combine these ideas with the haptics, so it will be very interesting that uh, uh, there are lots of plenty of applications we can target over that. In the, in the second phase, I wish to like, after the full parallax, computational full parallax light free space, we want to design about interaction, like interaction with the same content itself. So three basic uh, objectives we need to like, generating of auto stereoscopic 3D contents and superimposing 3D contents in the real space and developing a uh, direct touch interfaces for uh, integrating the 3D images. And, the same, like, uh, I will continue on my research about that computational head mounted displays. So we know that addressing the accommodation versions conflict, there are lots of designs have been proposed in the past and there are lots of advances happening. But focusing on a single integrated solution, combining the ideas of the deep learning with, and like machine learning advances with uh, the optics, skull designs. So it will have to come, uh, come I mean, a unified framework we are just targeting that could help us uh, in uh, adopting about the full range of computational tasks. For example, like that, we need what kind of point? accurate uh, defocused blur focus that multi layered decomposition. So, this are different, uh, the advantages of different kind of displays, like very focal, multi focus, we have to bring in into a single concept. And combining mathematical ideas of the tensor processing with the machine learning. And combining with this, uh, we'll have we we'll have the feasibility that we could be able to achieve in a single integrated framework. Further, I wish to continue about like uh, uh, if we have uh, a, like uh, we can address the accommodation versions conflicts very efficiently, and we are head mounted display, and also even on the three D displays, combining the idea of the light fields with machine learning will surely will help us in you know in the rural rehabilitation applications because. Haptics combining the, I mean, we need more kind of inputs in the haptics combination. Uh, we are uh, having the feasibility uh, solutions which have right now is mostly focusing on small surface areas. So just like the fingers. So, but if affordable and robust solutions, we can cover about the large surface areas and it could be useful in the neuro rehabilitation applications. So we need to bring this computational displays uh, and uh, the machine learning with the haptics technologies. Okay. So thank, you, this is what I yeah, thank you, Dr. Manchi. Now, uh, I request uh, Dr. Uh, Amit Gupta, please. R.K. Amit. Over to you, Dr. Amit. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Right. So, uh, I'll just keep it very brief. Uh, so, I work uh, mainly in the area of decision theory and game theory. And I sit in the Department of Management, so I have to look at uh, more from the industrial application side. So uh, one of the things uh, which I really want to look at the center is uh, how the, the technology of virtual reality can actually allow us to improve the decision making. Because uh, we talk uh, when we talk about decision making, it's also decision making under uncertainty. So when we, how we reason about uncertainty, can we actually improve the decision making using the tools like virtual reality? And I think one of the, the, the areas where I really want to emphasize is actually in the retailing, because uh, uh, if you look at uh, the, the business domain, one area where a lot of biases is actually the how we actually plan for the future, how we plan for the inventory. So one area where I want to actually emphasize is retailing, uh, other is manufacturing, and uh, 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 I think uh, Professor Lavelle is actually here because, uh, in fact, I have seen his book on uh, planning algorithms. So one of the area where we really want to look is uh, how we actually can uh, navigate in an uncertain environment. So it's mainly about uh, the improving the decision making under uncertainty. So this is the focus uh, of my association with the center. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mani. Thank you, uh, Dr. Amit. Now I request uh, Dr. Lada Diara. Over to you, Dr. Lada. Hi. 
am i audible yes you are audible yeah uh, i belong to management studies department at iit madras and uh, uh, my area has uh, uh, always been into human behavior trying to model and understand human behavior uh, in organizations uh, or rather workplaces so uh, my interest here is how do we have uh, the risk and uncertainty which is not a rational environment when it comes to humans so uh, how do decision making in uh, socio political and emotional environments uh, when they when uh, individuals work at organizations uh, can be modeled uh, so that the decision making uh, is or problem solving or decision making or it cuts across several of the uh, you know ethical moral uh, fairness justice uh, and trusting interactions and exchanges uh, can be modeled uh, and uh, here uh, typically in our uh, domain in organizational behavior uh, the methodologies have uh, always been self reported or experimental basis um, here uh, my interest uh, with uh, this particular center is how do we uh, employ uh, the augmented reality and that helps us to model the workplace interactions and workplace exchanges which will in turn inform how humans or how employees take decisions at workplaces now uh, individuals do not work alone uh, they work in a you know multi uh, individual environment so group behavior organizational system environment there are several contingencies which needs to be captured and we are trying to do that uh, through ar vr environment along with multi sensor uh, you know biofeedback so it has implications especially for organizational policies as well as uh, you know diversity and inclusion both from the organizational uh, standpoint as well as from the uh, societal impact so yeah that's something which we are wanting to look at yeah, sure. thank you dr lata yes now okay. yeah now let me go to uh, another next slide on uh, neuroscience and virtual reality for sir uh, strinivas chakravarti uh, is working on this areas he wants to use the clinical neuroscience and uh, you know, specifically on the applications of the you know several rehabilitation of the de diseases say stroke rehabilitation and uh, you know uh, other uh, you know uh, motor impairments or you no know, cognitive impairments and she, he also has a lot of interest in uh, working on the assistive technologies say you now very simple technologies not a very complicated or costly technologies because when you talk about assistive technology you uh, know it becomes uh, if the system is very costly it cannot it is not affordable to most of the uh, uh, people who are in need so he wants to develop a very very cost effective or affordable technologies using uh, uh, the latest technologies and uh, his research area so with this uh, introduction of our uh, members i would like to list a few projects very briefly and uh, here is one project with the mega project we would like to talk about is a virtual reality corridor or super highway or whatever it is we it, this is nothing but a, a set of startup companies and uh, industries oem partners academia all together for a mission mission of you know uh, virtual reality applications in many fields not only you know social uh, it can also be industries it can also be you now academia training education right so all kinds of applications we are trying to look at it but in the next two years we will be focusing on only few verticals for example uh, uh, in this center we call it as experiential technology innovation center here we are planning to focus on the virtual reality skills training can we now uh, impart virtual reality programming skills to now uh, many students specifically rural students and you know millions of rural students and in the next few years two years is what we are looking at it uh, it will have a separate experiential space 
it will have a separate manufacturing space in order to cater to the demand in India, where uh, now the Chinese products or now uh, hardware is not available. And we also have a, now another vertical on working on the medical training simulators, how virtual reality based medical training simulators are useful. So in the center, along with our uh, startup companies, we have several virtual reality based training simulators for our doctors are, are available at a different uh, technology readiness level. In the next few years, we will take uh, this uh, uh, simulators to the market and to put it in the hospitals, put it in use, take the feedback, and then probably we will start exporting this simulators to the other countries. Right now, we have a 100% import. In the next two years, we wanted to see that at least no, a few percentage of our uh, simulators are exported to other countries. And uh, uh, we have a few other ongoing projects. I request our project officer, uh, Jay Naresh, to uh, briefly discuss because we are running out of time. Over to you, uh, Jay Naresh. Thank you, Professor. Hi, everyone. It's good to join you guys today. Uh, so when we talk about projects and specifically, what we are actually looking forward is understanding uh, the turn of the century projects, which will help us uh, port this entire virtual reality into more functional formats. Now, what we are talking about here is digital well-being. We are looking at socially aware projects that could provide us an insight to the functions, the yes. applications. Uh, Jay, yeah. I, Jay uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I know you have a lot of things to say. You have done a lot of projects, but now we need to briefly go ahead. So sure. maybe now, why not we go to the project in, in which, yes. So probably this you can uh, just speak. Thank you. I'll do that. So uh, in this particular uh, concept, when we are working with a lot of uh, inclusivity and social aware, what we have found is a need for specialist hardware to extend the virtual reality experience. So in that concept, we are doing projects in which we are trying to bring in tactile feedback to touch screens, and at the same time have our own sensors which can actually compute human motion. So the project center is not alone about software, but also extending hardware to make VR more empathetic in nature. So all of our projects, we are trying to benchmark it against empathy and at the same time, the cost that it goes into and how far the VR needs to be extended to support it. Okay, thank you, Jay. You can uh, you know, speak about this slide as well. Sure. So in terms of the vision that we have under these projects, what we are looking at is we are looking to formulate a taptic engine. And we have already done similar projects in which uh, a definition of the whole system is possible today. We are also trying to see the scalability specifically for India-based use cases. So it's not alone India. There are more innovations happening in the market today where we are seeing how affordable these solutions can be scaled down for all the developing countries and more people to actually adopt it. And we are trying to define a customizable curriculum based on the sensors that we want to get from the entire embodiment. Uh, it could be rehabilitation, it could be any kind of uh, formulation that comes inside VR. We are trying to see that they should be personalized experience and not just one single line of code that keeps executing again and again. The bigger dream and objective that we want to do is we want this to be scalable so that we can actually take it to all the corners. And that is where our research is being focused with the adaptation for huge masses, just not for a particular company or a product that can be you know, formulated. So we are also working with the local agencies to get our products certified and tested so that there is complete confidence of how these projects can actually transform the entire scape in India. Thank you, Jay. And uh, I have few announcement uh, as part of the center. We have uh, young international faculty positions available. This is specifically for non-Indian citizens. They can come here as a faculty um, uh, and uh, with a very good salary. The details uh, can be you know, looked at this particular link. And there are many PhD positions are available. Right now, few PhD scholars are available. Uh, 
uh, there are six master's scholars positions are available. We are also planning to run a dual degree program in virtual reality technologies in IIT Madras, where uh, uh, students from parent departments of any uh, bachelor degree can you now uh, do a master's degree in virtual reality technologies. We are also going to announce a webinar series, monthly webinar series from our center. We will uh, request uh, uh, global leaders from both industries and academia and then government agencies to talk about the virtual reality technologies. Uh, with this, uh, we will come to a very important session of uh, inauguration of the uh, this uh, uh, COE. Uh, for this inauguration, uh, before this inauguration, I would like to briefly introduce this uh, center. Uh, uh, we call this as an Experiential Technology Innovation Center. There is a specific website. You can go into the details. This is the first center in India focusing on the no, uh, transdisciplinary innovation. So the whole idea of this innovation center is that it is not just the uh, software or it is not the hardware alone. It is the entire uh, uh, science and technology, medicine and psychology all come together in order to solve the challenges in the you know, uh, virtual reality so that innovation can be posted. So uh, in most of the uh, researchers around the world, our uh, virtual reality researchers focus only on the hardware or software, but we would like to emphasize on the you know, human mind or perception or sensation and measurements in the perception and the psychology side of it and uh, use this for you know, the progress in the in the uh, in the uh, Steve yeah, this is the unique uh, center in it. this is the first center for virtual reality and this is a unique center focusing on the now, uh, the human perception. And for inaugurating, I requested Dr. Chindan Vaisnav. Uh, Dr. Chindan Vaisnav is a, is a uh, uh, mission director in uh, uh, Niti Ayok's Atal Innovation Mission. He was the, uh, he was heading the Tata Innovation Center back at MIT. And he has a lot of passion for or social technology, and uh, 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 he has many uh, uh, many uh, accolades to his name. I request him to you know, uh, uh, speak about this center or the virtual reality technologies and in inaugurate this center. Over to you, Dr. Chindan. Thank you very much, Professor Mani uh, uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, yes, we can hear you all. Great. Thank you. So, well, it's a real privilege uh, to uh, be with you all and uh, uh, be a part of this uh, inauguration um, <clears throat> of, of, of the uh, AR VR centered uh, uh, center at uh, IIT Madras. Uh, first of all, my congratulations for, uh, for you to uh, you and colleagues to uh, spearhead this um, uh, direction of work. Um, uh, I, I'm actually very excited because uh, it will give uh, an anchor uh, to a lot of activity that I'm uh, seeing all across the country, uh, and uh, particularly with with uh, with a broad uh, vision like um, uh, a VR corridor, um, and uh, uh, you know one where um, one can take things all the way from research. Mm, to its translation, to entrepreneur innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, 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 the entire spectrum, including manufacturing and so on. So I really commend you for uh, uh, this vision, um, and 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 I, I really hope that it will become an anchor for uh, uh, bringing all of these various components uh, uh, of activities together in our nation. So I. Uh, for example, I, I definitely see three levels of uh, uh, work going on in various parts of the country. One is um, this whole idea of skilling uh, the next generation, uh, uh, particularly children. I think AR, VR, AI, all of that is going to be a part of literacy in some ways. So, you know, uh, to be a, uh, if, if one were, wanted to join the future workforce. Um, what I, 
uh, what I see is children are extremely excited about it. So as uh, uh, you, you would recall, um, your center uh, participated in uh, this uh, program that Atal Innovation is, Mission is running called Tinkerpreneur Bootcamp. This is a nine week long uh, uh, online program where children are taught how to go from an idea uh, to a digital venture. And there are some 20,000 students registered for it. And there's just enormous amount of uh, excitement about it. So I think uh, we have 8,000 or so tinkering labs now and growing. Uh, and so hopefully we can take uh, this um, education to many, many more students. So, that the, so that's the skill part. The, I also see that specialization wise, I am beginning to see incubation centers, which say that we specialize in AR and VR, for instance, something in Rajasthan, something in Mumbai, all of, all of those people, that is an indicator of, uh, you know, things moving in a um, uh, sort of a forward direction. So again, they will find an anchor in IIT Madras. Um, and then uh, lastly, I, I also want to mention that uh, I see tremendous application in, um, I mean, in many fields, but including governance uh, and uh, 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 you know uh, I, I see so much experimentation going on within the uh, uh, governance realm in at district level state levels uh, using AR and VR so I think uh, there also uh, it's going to play a major uh, major role so I I really uh, um, I look forward to uh, how this center proceeds and uh, working alongside and being a part of it uh, as uh, necessary. So uh, once again, congratulations and uh, uh, great yeah. to be a part of this. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Dr. Chintan for inaugurating and uh, sharing your vision for our uh, virtual reality or uh, particularly for India innovation. And uh, we, we hope we will live up to your, you know, your expectations and then deliver in the coming days working with you. Thank you. Professor Manivadan, may I add one more thing that I forgot yes. to mention? Yes, uh, please. It would be particularly exciting if we can teach these things also in local languages. Uh, we have seen a lot of interest in learning innovation and new technologies in your own languages. And I think uh, that that will really open up doors yes. for decoupling people's ability to learn from the medium of instruction. So. Yes. yes, virtual reality technologies can be helpful in uh, vernacular languages. So definitely. Thank you, Dr. Chintan. Thank now you. I, yeah, now I request uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Neeraj Mittal to inaugurate our consortium for uh, augmented and virtual reality environments. This CAVE consortium is the first consortium in India. It's a consortium of all the startup companies and then uh, academia and then OEMs and industries together for uh, achieving the engineering mission of uh, now this virtual reality corridor. Unless we all come together, we cannot now achieve a big uh, uh, mission project such as the virtual reality corridor. Um, I request uh, Dr. Neeraj Mittal. Dr. Neeraj Mittal is a principal secretary of uh, IT department Government of India uh, is an IAS officer, and uh, he was the managing director and the CEO of Guidance Tamil Nadu. Uh, during his tenure, the Guidance had a lot of projects, bubbling projects. He got got enough. Probably the Tamil Nadu got the most funding in, uh, among Indian states even during the lockdown. And he is known for his uh, no, dynamic and uh, no, uh, forthright uh, no, approach in, uh, in uh, his uh, field. So I request Dr. Niresh Mitchell, uh, please inaugurate the CAVE uh, Center and uh, say a few words about this uh, consortium and then virtual reality, how we can no, serve uh, uh, Tamil Nadu or uh, no, yeah, IT industries in India. Dr. Neeraj? Dr. Neeraj? Okay. He has been added uh, as an attendee. 
is not part of panel. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Prakash Damodaran, so can you please uh, uh, inaugurate the cave uh, uh, instead of uh, Dr. Neeraj? Dr. Neeraj uh, uh, was Hello, saying Professor. that... Yeah, yeah, yeah Neeraj, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, can you join as a panelist? Uh, yes, please go ahead, Dr. Neeraj. Thank you, Dr. Manivanan. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, Thanks great. for joining. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm really, you know, excited to be here, and uh, it's it's a it's an absolutely new experience for me, um, you know, uh, and a learning experience today as to what technology can do. And as you know, I'm very happy to inaugurate this cave uh, consortium because I think this is a as uh, you know, uh, the, the first speaker, the founder of Ocular said, this is a completely interdisciplinary field. And I think not interdisciplinary, all disciplines together. It's, it's mind boggling to see how you are all integrating all these different technologies to bring uh, this haptic experience and a real virtual experience to, to humankind. Uh, I think apart from the things that Dr. Chintan and other speakers have said, I think one of the other possibly advantages of such a technology would be to democratize the experience, right? I mean, you could possibly think of, you know, having a, a look at Kiladi, you know, excavations at, uh, at home without going there. And it will have a real democratizing, uh, you know, potential for people at all levels of, uh, you know, uh, of social strata to be able to see and experience different kind of uh, you know things which otherwise they may not have been able to do so i think you know the growth of the technology itself you know uh, i read that it's going to be somewhere around 1 trillion dollar by 2030 uh, growth rate of 43% so as economy grows in tamil nadu uh, honorable chief minister recently had a review and we kind of you know came to this understanding that as the economy is growing, we need to move towards, you know, the use of technology more and more in providing good, you know, services. And as services grow, especially in technology side, uh, all these skills will become important. We produce roughly four lakh graduates every year, uh, and we need to provide them jobs, we need to provide them aspiration. And I think these technologies and the startups which you are bringing in under this umbrella will be really, really useful. So my, you know, my best wishes to you and your colleagues here. Uh, and we look forward from government of Tamil Nadu to be able to support you in any way so that this can become a roaring success. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Niraj. And we hope you know, we, will, we can work with you and then uh, now realize your vision for Tamil Nadu as well. Thank you so much for inaugurating the cave. And now I request uh, uh, Professor Mandayam Srinivasan. He's a founder and director of uh, MIT Touch Lab. And he's a global leader of uh, no, modern haptics, I would say. Uh, uh, right now, he's a, a professor of haptics in the Department of Computer Science, University of College of London, UK. Uh, over to you, Professor Srinivasan. Hi. So can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, very good. So um, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me and to be part of this uh, exciting new venture. Uh, it is great to see, uh, first of all, you know, uh, Professor Manivanan was a long time ago, a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. And it was exciting to see him go back to India and start a lab with haptics uh, in its name. Now it is next stage where he has now a program, an institute uh, that is named after haptics. And so this is very nice and exciting times. And he knows that we have explored together to bring haptics to India over a long period of time. So this is definitely a major milestone in, in that achievement. So congratulations to you, Mani, uh, <clears throat> for getting it to this stage. And also what I find really uh, impressive is the kind of coalition of people that you have put together. I mean, it is 
lot larger than just having technologists or even uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, it is also bringing in uh, government people, administrators, uh, various social science people. So it is, I think, uh, <clears throat> very nice that uh, uh, this, all of these people, uh, all of you together are working on this and I would be happy to help. Um, so what uh, uh, Dr. Manimanan asked me was just to talk a little bit about my research. And let me share the screen <clears throat> just because there was a question about haptics and so on. So let's see if my screen share works. Um, uh, let's see here. So can you see my uh, the talk? Uh, the slides? Yes, we can see. We can see. <clears throat> okay, very good. Okay, um, so the, I mean, just so that uh, uh, just in my introduction, uh, you know, so I had a laboratory, Touch Lab, which I started and I was functioning for 30 years at MIT. Uh, and then now I have, a, I am in the computer science department of University College London, where I have a Touch Lab. But also my association with IIT Madras is that I am a Vajra visiting professor uh, so the, my collaboration with uh, Mani Vandan's lab and uh, others, it continues. So there was a question in between where it said, what is haptics and what is, uh, and I just want to elaborate a little bit more on what uh, Professor Mani Vandan said earlier. So haptics originally in, so from 1900 to say even 1990, it just referred to psychological study of active touch by humans. Active touch meaning exploration, manipulation, where we actively try to uh, get information from the environment or manipulate the environment. Then around 1990, various technologies coalesced. Um, there was the uh, sensing as well as actuator technologies and robotics and so on. So we broadened the term to include machines and virtual environments as well into haptics. So our working definition of haptics that we have given, we have used for over two, three decades and well accepted by the community is uh, say for non-techies, if you want to say, you just say it is the science and technology of manual exploration and manipulation. Of course, in conjunction with vision, in conjunction with other auditory modalities, or even perhaps taste and smell. Um, so it is essentially haptics deals with the science uh, and technology of manual exploration and manipulation. Science part is uh, mainly in terms of understanding the human side of things. And the technology, of course, is developing machines of various sophistication to, to do this. And then for techies, uh, so then it's a little more uh, precise definition. It is pertaining to information acquisition and object manipulation through touch. <clears throat> it can be by humans or by machines, or it can be in, in virtual real environments, virtual environments or teleoperated environments. Te teleoperated environments, as, as you all know, is that the human operator sits in one part in, in, in let's say one room and then is able to operate at a distance in another place, which can be within the same room or across a continent. So in terms of my research, um, so we have worked on uh, over the past three decades, we have worked on all aspects of haptics, uh, whether it is human haptics, machine haptics, uh, and then we, we coined a new uh, discipline essentially in the 90s, which is called computer haptics, which is analogous to computer vision uh, in the sense that it pertains to the software part of it. Of course, this being haptics and interactive, it is not purely a display, but it is interactive devices. So there is the sensing part and the actuation part. Uh, whereas in vision, it would be only displays from the computer side of things. So computer haptics and then human machine interactions in a wide variety of applications. So uh, the research and development areas we have worked in is biomechanics of touch. This is analogous to how visual transduction or auditory transduction uh, with hair cells in the cochlea take place. This has to do with uh, the mechanics part of it. Then under sensation, it is to do with um, neuroscience, for example, or psychophysics, uh, which is uh, measuring 
sensation in various ways or, or um, any aspect of how transduction happens beyond the biomechanics part of it. Uh, and then there is also motor control. So all of these are essentially pertaining to the science of haptics of humans. Then uh, technology development, machine haptics, you would have tactile stimulators, uh, haptic interfaces, tactile displays, you know, these are essentially pertain to sensing if a human, what the intent of the human is. So for example, if you type on a computer keyboard, it is a haptic action that is conveying, uh, you know, your intent to the computer. And if the keyboard had actuators in it, it could display back to you that what the computer intended you to uh, feel. So, uh, so it would be typically in a robot that you could touch and feel virtual objects. Then there is the computer haptics and there it is all the software and mathematical algorithms and software in terms of haptic rendering and whether it is shape of an object, texture of an object, softness and so on. All of this we can do today and, and generally quite well uh, as far as our interaction with the world through a tool uh, such as a, a stick for example, we can do quite well, but actual touch in terms of full, full tactile and kinesthetic uh, displays, it is still a little far away. So then human machine interactions. So there is, you need human perception and, you know, illusions was mentioned before. Uh, all of these you should understand in a, well in order to create uh, virtual reality or teleoperator conditions that are satisfactory. So then there are, of course, we have worked on uh, clinical applications. It can be hand evaluation for rehabilitation. It can be smart prostheses. Uh, it can be virtual reality-based trainers, such as in surgical simulation with uh, I and Manivanan have worked uh, for a long time uh, in terms of our training surgeons, say, uh, to perform surgery, say, minimally invasive surgery through uh, virtual reality-based trainers. Uh, there is also telemedicine, for example, uh, Da Vinci is a uh, well-known device where it's a robotic device. So you can do robotics, telerobotic surgery, which is done uh, every day all over the world. Then there are a variety of uh, spin-off technologies, advanced robot design, maybe wearable computers and virtual reality itself has a lot of applications, whether it's education, entertainment, training and so on and teleoperation systems as well. So uh, then I just want to, so multiple applications, which I list here. Um, but one of the things I wanted, uh, Manivanan wanted to talk about uh, was about the research that we are doing at uh, UCL right now. So there, you know, primarily one of the uh, things that we have built um, recently is a teleoperation system, which is essentially like an electromechanical microscope. That is, imagine that you have a haptic interface through which you can touch and feel something at human scale. Now it is connected to, let's say even an atomic force microscope. And force microscope has sensors and actuators and whatever the human commands in terms of moving the haptic interface will control the atomic force microscope and each sensor then will sense, let's say the compliance of a, a worm or compliance of a cell. And then we can scale it up to humans and display it. That means you can touch and feel nanometer scale, uh, uh, you know, mechanical events. And we have used it, for example, to explore the biomechanics of C. elegans. C. elegans is a nematode, a, it's like an earthworm kind of um, a, okay. a, a worm that is that has only like 300 plus neurons and it is very well known. It can be genetically modified, it is transparent and it has short lifespan. So you can have multiple generations of those and it can be studied in a lab. So we have used it as a model organism and used our micro uh, teleoperation in order to explore the biomechanics of CL GANs and the neuroscience of CL GANs and its own reaction to our touch stimuli and so on, both at micron scale as well as, as at nanometer scale. And so this, this kind of research, biomechanics research or neuroscience research can be done at all scales using a system such as these. Um, 
Then, of course, there are, uh, we have also done in the past, uh, we have demonstrated uh, first transatlantic touch uh, between our lab at MIT and the University College London. We have done brain controlled machines. That is, there was a monkey at Duke, which had electrodes implanted in its brain and its actions were conveyed to my lab at MIT. So the monkey was at Duke. Um, this was a collaboration with uh, Dr. Uh, Nicolelis. Um, and so, so, yeah, uh, Strini, yeah. I think, yeah, there's a lot of uh, uh, okay. research so, like, you can talk finish. about it. It's very, very exciting to hear from the you know, global leader now uh, from yeah. yourself. Now, uh, I'm glad yeah. the uh, audience would like to you know, keep hearing from you. But you know, because of the time, and right. uh, okay. may, yeah, we can go to the next uh, speaker. Yeah, this is fun. So yeah. uh, thank you very much. We can... I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Strini. We are very sure. glad to hear from the you know, global leader from yourself. So uh, can we, uh, yeah, can you please unshare it so that I can share? Yes. Yeah. And finally, uh, I request uh, Dr. Venkat Sadanan to speak briefly about our research. Dr. Venkat Sadanan is a engineer, economist, and a neurosurgeon. And he's uh, right now working in Loma Linda uh, uh, as a pediatric surgeon. He visits India very often, and uh, he guides uh, all of our students and uh, he does free surgery. Over to you, Dr. Venkat. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Manimanan. This is a wonderful conference you've put together. I really think that the uh, uh, foundation of innovations always lies in interdisciplinary work. And uh, that is uh, what you're putting together. I'm especially uh, uh, very fortunate to be able to meet uh, uh, Dr. Laval, uh, about whom I've read quite a bit, and of course uh, have the opportunity to see uh, Professor Srinivasan. Uh, I, uh, it's a pleasure to see him as well, and of course you as well, Professor Manimanan. Thank you for putting this together. So my, uh, uh, I have just one slide, and I want to sort of uh, briefly give you an idea within the five minutes to uh, be able to put together a, a research agenda that addresses some immediate practical problems and requirements that are needed in the field of surgery uh, with spin-off innovations in other fields. The three fields I'm most familiar with is uh, uh, I am a game theorist um, and uh, having published extensively in that came into neurosurgery and I've practiced for decades as a neurosurgeon. Um, and as an engineer, I'm able to see certain uh, ways to meld uh, the innovations, the current innovations in these three fields. So in particular, with uh, Professor Manivanan and his lab, we are looking at improving surgical outcomes uh, using haptic devices. Uh, Professor Srinivasan and uh, Professor Manivanan have developed various training devices for uh, surgeons. And uh, they are just amazing in terms of the outcomes pre and post training. And so um, we have tried to adapt one of these uh, for the purposes of training surgeons prior to actually going into surgery. Currently, without this kind of haptic training, uh, uh, I train surgeons, it's, and it's not just me, all the surgeons are trained directly uh, in, the sur in active surgery, live surgery with robots. So, um, I mean, you can fool around with robot only so much prior to surgery, but then the first time you really are seriously going to use it is during the surgery. And that's not very optimal. Uh, the second thing we are involved in is rehabilitation for Parkinson's disease. As you know, it's a, uh, a motor disorder. And unfortunately, the treatment and management of Parkinson's hasn't changed over 50 years. And uh, one of the things that uh, is being developed in uh, the lab in IIT Madras is uh, a way to train 
uh, Parkinson's patients using both a combination of VR and haptic feedback to be able to overcome certain, uh, um, I, the word disability is not politically correct, but certain uh, uh, motor deficiencies that they may have. And uh, in based on one or two patients so far, the idea seems to be having good promise. The other area we're working on is preoperative surgical planning. Um, as a neurosurgeon, I can vouch for you that there is very little in this area. Uh, we use a system uh, and we're all married to that system called uh, navigation system. They come with various manufacturers. The most popular one is called Stealth. And this helps us navigate within the brain, given the anatomy as we are uh, we've got, uh, we have both our hands in the brain, but it is not good enough. Uh, the morbidity and mortality must be improved, can be improved. And uh, pre-surgical planning where we can peel off layers of the, starting with the scalp right down to the lesion in the brain is not only invaluable, but will aid uh, in uh, outcomes, uh, surgical outcomes, especially in neurosurgery, where the tolerances are usually within a millimeter. Um, you can make a person blind or make a person stop breathing. So we, we, we can't afford that. So uh, the last thing that I am working on uh, is a, uh, and uh, I've applied for a patent for this, is for brain computer interfaces using, uh, I'm also an epilepsy surgeon. So one of the things that I do is implants that uh, Professor Mar uh, Srinivasan just mentioned. Uh, we, uh, I, I, I uh, implant uh, uh, these um, uh, devices and sensors uh, in the brain using a robot, ironically, uh, Rosa, without any feedback at all. So uh, it, it's blind uh, helping a blind person, it's equivalent to that, but using stealth navigation. So we are doing the best that we can. And, uh, you know, I have implanted about 4,000 of these electrodes uh, and have had only one instance of bleeding, but that one instance is enough to tell me that we need to improve. So uh, this is where we are going. And uh, I wanted to let you know that the three fields of game theory, my area is in non-cooperative games and solutions using recursive learning. Uh, surgery and engineering are not divorced and diverse from each other. And it is in the, in the interaction in, among these fields that the future of innovation lies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Venkat. So uh, you and uh, uh, all the special guests, uh, Professor Srinivasan and uh, Dr. Chintan and Michal, they all know, uh, they have a lot of things to, you know, uh, uh, say to our audience and our audience also willing to listen, but you know, uh, probably we will separate, we will arrange a separate uh, now webinar uh, for each one of you. And uh, with this, uh, I hand over the session to Dr. Uh, Steve. Over to you, Dr. Steve. Thank you. Thank you all our special guests. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. It was uh, really nice to hear from everyone and um, it's exciting to see so many people with all of this expertise coming together. There's a, there's a lot that we have in common. And so, so it's exciting to be able to interact through the center. Um, so so I have, we have some time for questions remaining, I hope. Uh, the, the time is running running short. So I, I guess the plan was to do some questions. I will. Yeah. Yes, uh, we... yes Dr. Steve, I mean, you can, you can, uh, you can go for like a, a couple of questions, which is uh, like a, a more okay. uh, mandatory or it's like a, uh, all right, but, but Dr. Manivanan, but if you still insist, like uh, we should be going for a bit. Uh, yeah, you can... yeah, maybe for five minutes we can uh, take some questions and then we can close. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Professor, session. yes, absolutely, yeah. Okay, um, well, one one kind of general question I have is, you know, if, if it's uh, the human vision sense, then we have displays and cameras and large industries following both of those. They work very well. If it's the hearing sense, then um, you know we have microphones and speakers, and that seems to be going pretty well. So for the touch sense, um, why aren't we so far along? Um, why is this so difficult? What's really the challenge or limitation here that needs to be addressed? Yeah, uh, Professor Strenuwasan, would you like to take? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, in touch, the thing is when we started, say around 30, 40 years ago, there was 
technological problems on all sides. We had poor sensors, we had poor actuators. So a combination of them and the computers were too slow compared to the human system. Um, so for example, in vision, if you just give 30 frames a second, there is already fusion. Whereas in touch, the Pacinians can follow one kilohertz. Um, so it is, it is difficult to do these things. And now what has fortunately in the last 20, 30 years, the sensors have improved a lot and they have become more affordable. They are more sensitive and so on. But still we have a challenge with actuators. Actuators are still, you know, compared to say human muscles or, uh, uh, you know, human muscle fiber, for example, we have a problem. So once that is developed, I think the computational part is fine. The sensor part is somewhat okay but actuators really need further development. I see. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, so, um, so, so, so in, in, in the incorporation of haptics into a VR system, um, you know, why, 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 don't, why don't we find sort of effective haptics in sort of standard um, consumer products or other, other kinds of VR systems as, as much as we see the, the hearing and visual parts. So, so why is it that the, Maybe it's related to my first question, but but I'm just wondering, like, as as you as you're do, as you're using haptics in VR in particular, um, well, what's really the challenge? And this is for anyone on the panel as well. So, yeah. Venka, do you want to take it? You are muted. Yeah, I guess it's hard to speak and hear without uh, <laughs> the microphone. So. I, I, and that highlights one of the problems with this. So I, I think the way we process uh, vision and uh, uh, auditory inputs is so different. And as you said, Professor Srinivasan, just the simple, uh, the, the frequency at which we can uh, digest that input uh, is so different between the two um, that once we develop um, the, the necessary ways to process this information and feed that to the brain, we are sailing home. The problem is that these are not uh, serial inputs. That is, you know, they're not mutually independent inputs. And as we can see from people who are blind, uh, the, you, that vision can help us learn Audit, uh, auditory inputs faster and auditory inputs can help us learn vision faster. So these two interact with each other uh, so much that one has to, much like what Professor Manimanan's uh, lab was working on recently uh, uh, with uh, Pachinian uh, corpuscles and uh, both electrical and mechanical stimulation and how that interaction changes the threshold. The same thing with vision and auditory uh, inputs as well. So I think one has to understand, or I would like to understand, I'm sorry, I would like to understand how these two augment each other's uh, learning. And that's that's the barrier I'm facing right now. Oh, I see what you mean. It's, it's very interesting to consider how the senses come together. Um, yeah. in this context. Multimodal is, so uh, I can uh, address just the haptic part of it. One of the issues is that, see auditory uh, sensors and even display speakers, essentially, we have had for over hundred years. It has a long history and you need very little energy actually for uh, that to operate at, even though it operates at 20 kilohertz up to 20 kilohertz. You need very little energy. And if you just vibrate pressure waves in the air, you can sense it and so on. Whereas in, in vision, of course, we have had more, it's more recent and especially television uh, in the sense of spatio-temporal vision. It has probably again, another already now, maybe 80 years perhaps. Um, and displays have been there. And those also, they are at much lower frequency and the technology has a long history. But in touch, the problem is you don't, you want to apply a matrix of forces on the skin and each of them controllable up to a kilohertz and each of them at a spatial resolution of less than a millimeter. If you want to convey something to the fingertip, you need a tactile television that is like 100 by 100 uh, and, or maybe at least 20, 30 by 30 matrix 
each of them moving at one kilohertz. That technology we don't have yet. And to make it into uh, regular gaming and so on, all this needs to be done at several hundred dollars or maybe at most a thousand dollars. And for that, you require a large uh, manufacturing and marketing kind of uh, uh, you know, enterprise. And we don't have that yet. We don't have a Hollywood to bankroll it. Um, so these are all the various issues. So that's very interesting. So when you describe moving these say mechanical pixels at a thousand Hertz, um, are, are there physical obstructions? Will it just simply not work? Do you think there's like, like it just the physics won't work out because of momentum and things, or, or do you think it's actually no, doable? I, I don't think there is any fundamental physical uh, limitation and mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be thousand Hertz to start with. You know, we can have like old movies which are like flickering, you know, we could have even that. Uh, so you could do it, but it is either extremely expensive to do right now, uh, and, and therefore it is hard to put it all together. We, we can do few pixels, uh, taxels, uh, we call, as we call it, taxels. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, but uh, I don't think there is any physical limitation. It is just that we need to have the right kind of actuators uh, that needs to be miniaturized. So MEMS technologies, for example, if that's applied uh, with sufficient energy and funding, I would think could solve that problem. Mm, very interesting. Dr. I Levar, you too about something analogous to flicker fusion thresholds for vision. So yeah, are there sort is. of fusion thresholds for, for haptics as well? But um, perhaps you'd like to talk as well, uh, Dr. Venka. Uh, sorry, yes. Um, I, I think, uh, uh, this is wonderful to, to see how um, the direction in which we can go move forward. Um, and the interaction between our senses, I think I, I, I come back to that because it plays a crucial role in this. Um, often our, our brain does interpolate, our brain does adapt and rather rapidly. And that adaptability can be influenced by other senses, input from other senses. Very simple, for, I, I've seen uh, you know, pa patients uh, for whom I do a hemispherectomy uh, and they, they lose their uh, uh, speech or they lose their motor abilities. Within a year, if they are young enough, the plasticity of the brain and inputs from other sources take over and new circuits are formed and the patient is able to move and speak. And it's just amazing. So we are a lot more complex system uh, than we usually give ourselves credit to. Um, the same thing with the uh, compensation for uh, visual impairment. Uh, if, for example, I have problems with extraocular movements and I, I have diplopia, double vision, and I'm not able to see properly, you'll notice that you know, people start tilting their heads uh, even children do that without their knowledge. They just start tilting to compensate for a deficit. Uh, and uh, so our brain and our other senses are brought in. So we may not need the perfection that we would like for a machine to be able to learn something as compared to us to, be learned the sa to learn the same thing because of our compensation abilities or compensatory abilities. It's interesting, as you say, all, all of these things fit together. And, and I think engineers tend to overly modularize things. You know, they want to break the big system into components and everyone goes and does their components separately. Maybe we accidentally impose that too much in our thinking about humans and brains yes. and that sort of thing, over compartmentalizing and not realizing how it's all interconnected, where yeah. neuroplasticity can save you, for example. And, uh, exactly. That's very interesting. You yeah. can certainly take advantage of all the multimodal illusions like you, you mentioned earlier, for sure. And you know that can certainly do it. Now, even in auditory and visual things. You know, so, for example, the current technology having a tweeter and a woofer and a subwoofer. You know, it, it developed over time, and and it takes advantage of the limitations of the human system in being able to separate it. And similarly, in vision too, it took a while in terms of how the correct trade-off would be, in terms of the spatial resolution versus the temporal frequency and so on. So we need to, once we have some even minimal devices, they can certainly help a lot, like Dr. Venkat said, that we can take, into, take advantage of other modalities 
And, yeah, even and just RGB, RGB light making you think that you see yeah, all yeah. the colors. Yeah, yeah just color. RGB, for example, was, was good enough. Yeah, bright color theory, for example. That's right. Yeah. Um, very good, very good. I, I, this is a great discussion. I feel like we could go on for hours. This is wonderful. <laughs> uh, I think, unfortunately, Professor Mani and others have this burden of time constraints. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think, no, uh, we can say we have just started understanding our human uh, perception. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, no, research have to be done to completely understand. There's a long way to go, I guess. It's just a starting. Isn't it uh, Srini and Venkat? Yes, yes. A long, uh, sorry, long Professor Srinivasan, why don't you go ahead first? No, 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 go ahead. I, uh, I, no, I really admire your work. So <laughs> uh, I, I think... Um, we have a long way to go, but that is always the case with human advancements. There's always a long way and we have to start somewhere. The good news is that we are way ahead of the start line. The start already has happened and we are just moving forward. Uh, the more we understand how the human brain processes inputs from so many sources and then creates a response to it. So the uh, the re receiving the inputs, processing and creating a response. That, that black box is, the, is where the key is, I think. And, and the more we understand that, more innovations are inevitably going to come out. So, yeah, you were also no, running this Connectome project, Ring Connectome project, isn't it? That tells you the you know, complexity of the you know, brain, isn't it? Dr. Yes. Venkat? Yes. yes, yes, correct. Um, the, it, it's just incredible. I mean, I think uh, we have bare, it is of course a version of Russell's paradox where our brain tries to understand our brain. But the, the nature of our, uh, of human brain and mind, uh, Wilfred Penfield uh, wrote about that, one of a very, uh, a pioneer in epilepsy surgery and a well-known neurosurgeon. He passed away um, some time ago, but uh, the nature of how, if you take for example, a, a robot, we tend to look at a robot and say, let me figure out how I should devise ways by which I can interact better with the robot. The, by definition, interact is a two-way street. I also need to make improvements on how the robot can interact with me. So we need to also, at the same time, equally focus on developing technologies for the machine to be able to learn and comprehend this human being with which it is interacting. And that is happening uh, just as much as it is happening using VR and haptics in the human side to interact with the robot on the robot side to interact with the human is also uh, developing. So I think that eventually we are able, we will be able to uh, come closer together uh, and, and uh, advance, especially um, uh, rehabilitation and uh, uh, outcome of uh, healthcare. All right, very good. Thank you. This is a great discussion. So I, I think at this point we should probably conclude, although I, I would love to go on longer. This is really great. Um, so, so I think I'm supposed to hand over now to the uh, webinar coordinator, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, sure. Sure, Steve. Thank you so much for moderating. Yeah, and congratulations to you guys. It's really exciting. So I'm happy to be involved with the center as well. So. Thank you. Ari. Thank you so much. I, yes, thank you. The human perception is a key to how uh, we are innovation. That is a conclusion we can say, isn't it? Yes, certainly. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Steve, and thank you, Dr. Manivinan, and thank everyone of you. Thank everyone of the panelists being present here and making this possible. I mean, without your time and uh, effort, this uh, wouldn't be a possible one. So I would like to uh, thank you, the audiences. Uh, I think we can close the session.